Let me tell you a story. I've been listening to the hype surrounding AI. Here's the idea. Let's have an AI write a simple web app. I describe the web app to the AI, and it can then architect and code the app. I sit back and collect the fruits of its labors. Here's a look at the app. It's called Persona Pro. It's straightforward, a thinly disguised database to hold what are called personas. Personas are useful when telling a large language model how to react to or respond to queries. In many ways, Persona Pro follows the lineage of software almost as old as computers themselves. Like the devil, it has been known by many names. You've heard them before, COBOL, HyperCard, DBase. SQL, web apps, and so on. The main purpose is to present a database to work with to a user. Some of the presentations have better lipstick than others. These types of apps have been around for many decades. It doesn't seem like much of a challenge, does it? ChatGPT came up with an architecture. You'll recognize it. It's been the most popular over the last 10 years. A database connected to a backend server communicating with a front end through JSON. It chose Flask as the back end and React.js for the front end. We worked on the back end first, which was surprisingly straightforward and pleasant. Instead of a database, simple JSON files were generated by ChatGPT to hold sample personas. I would describe a persona and the fields to populate and ChatGPT would generate it. All of the sample personas were placed in a directory. While the idea of describing a UI in natural language and having it magically appear on the screen is seductive, in practice, it's whatever the opposite of that that is, some of the results were comical, others were close. Pixel perfect, it ain't. And so many issues. In this architecture, there are two servers running. One is for the Flask backend, and the other for the React.js frontend. ChatGPT is relatively good at fixing compile or syntax errors, even though it generated them in the first place. Spread across two servers and a growing code base, things broke down quickly. Finally, I finished the code by myself just to move on. I wanted to share the experience in a video, but there wasn't that much to share. Yeah, it doesn't work, but smart people like you already know that. I'll take my loss and move on. Before we get to the second story, I'd appreciate a comment about your experience using AI tools to help code. Some code is very straightforward. Do you have an AI write it, or at least write the outline to get started? Writing unit tests and documentation can be a pain. Do you use AI to do that for you after you finish writing the code? Do you have what I'll call deeper conversations to discuss coding challenges with the AI? Or do you say F off with that AI stuff and write assembler like a real man? On to the second part of our story. Dynamic land is this incredible research space where physical objects and code merge. It's a place where you can literally touch, move, and interact with code in real time. Imagine a room where the entire environment is programmable. It's been on my inspiration list for quite some time. Do yourself a favor, go check out their website. The Dynamic Land website front page is a skeuomorphic representation of a bookshelf. On the bookshelf, there are different types of media. Today we're looking at an annotated video. I'm Brett. This is the Dynamic Land website. Dynamic Land is a nonprofit research lab creating a humane dynamic medium. And what that means is a way for real people in the real world to explore ideas together, not just with words and pictures, but with computation. But for us, computation doesn't mean scrolling around in screens. It means working out in the real world with physical materials. Brett Victor, the main principal behind Dynamic Land, introduced this idea about 10 years ago. Back then, I coded up a prototype of the idea just to satisfy my own curiosity. Unfortunately, there weren't very many good public APIs at the time to support playback in the browser, and getting transcripts of video were done manually. Automated transcribing wasn't a thing yet. This also got me to thinking, why are the current websites such a boring experience? Most don't even qualify as an experience. Think Hacker News, Reddit, X, Twitter, Google. Most are just a few fragments of text in a hyperlink surrounded by advertisements. Oh, wait a minute. Chinese zoo admits to painted dogs as pandas. These Chinese dogs are very clever. I'll take the hit. Jetsonhacks.com isn't the shining star of experience-based web design either. So here's the second idea. Take what I've learned from having ChatGPT help me and build an annotated video of a Jetson Hacks video. Let's take a look at the application I'm going to build. The web page is being served locally from an NVIDIA Jetson Orin Nano. In the left pane, we have our video. In the right pane, we have an annotated transcript. This holds a video transcript, headers, images, and web links. Think of it as supplemental multimedia support for the video article. The video is hosted on YouTube on the Jetson Hacks channel. Let's start the video. Chances are you've heard about Docker and containers. 
how they can seem big and complex at first glance. But the concept behind containers is surprisingly simple and intuitive. Let me lower the sound. The audio matches the currently highlighted paragraph in the transcript. There are labeled links in the about area which correspond to the normal YouTube chapters. Images in the transcript represent bookmarks in the video. Let's scroll down a little bit. When we click the image, the video and the transcript seek to that point. The transcript may also contain web links. Clicking on the link opens the web page in another tab. Now, here's the clever bit. When you click the overview link, the transcript view is transformed. This is the same transcript content, but in a column layout. The chapter headings act as column breaks. Let me zoom out a little. It's quite a different feeling even though it is the same content. This allows an overview which is quite different than just a video alone. Clicking a paragraph starts the video in the associated thumbnail. And signals. Memory management directly manages memory allocation and deallocation. It plays a Clicking the close button brings us back to our original view. YouTube generates video transcripts. These are just sentence fragments and difficult to read. We could grab the transcript from here. However, there's a Python library which we can use to download the transcript. Okay, so we download the transcript. The next part I thought would be easy. Pass the transcript to ChatGPT and have it create sentences and paragraphs from the sentence fragments. I figured it'd take an hour or so to get a workable transcript and add starting times to each paragraph. That's where I fell straight into the quagmire. The first problem is that there appeared to be too much text for it to process at once. The next problem is that it would try to generate code to group the text instead of using its magic LLM powers. I explored the code option a little, but it's no bueno as we say here in SoCal. Eventually, I ended up writing this prompt, which I found works intermittently at best, but close enough for rock and roll. This is where I would do any sentence restructuring. Then there was a tussle trying to put timestamps with the text. That's an algorithm that's difficult to describe in natural language, so I just wrote it myself. Eventually, I got something close to working. Once the paragraphs are prepared, I add additional web links or HTML styling as needed. Next up, generating thumbnails. That's pretty simple. I have the source video, so I wrote a script which told FFmpeg to grab a screenshot at a given time. There weren't that many, so I hand-coded up a JSON file with the timestamp and a link to the thumbnail in a server directory. Likewise with the chapter headers. The chapter headers were the same as those on the YouTube page. Then ChatGPT helped me write a function to weave the header, thumbnails, and paragraphs together to present in the transcript pane. I knew what the HTML had to look like for the page. The body of the page is basically two divs, one for the video, the other for the transcript. The paragraphs in the transcript become HTML paragraphs in the transcript div. There's some CSS styling for each entry. The server-side code only took a few hours. Most of that was just learning fast HTML. The basic prototype was up and running at the beginning of the third day. It took the rest of the day to figure out how to add some of the accoutrements, like how to add style sheets to the header instead of the body. Super simple, barely an inconvenience. All in all, the server is around 170 lines of code in the prototype. The JavaScript is a couple of hundred, which includes controlling the video player. The CSS is 60 lines let's say under 500 lines of code once it's all built out. To me, that feels like it's within the reach of many developers. Now, you're asking, what's this have to do with programming small systems? Here's the thing. Modern systems inevitably need to interface through the web or a UI. It's a different style of programming than many developers are used to. There are a few concepts, servers, markup language, style sheets, client-side programs. Many tutorials and reference material lead you to believe that you need to build enterprise-scale services for your projects. While you can certainly learn to do that on a small machine, it's probably a mismatch to what you are actually trying to accomplish. Here's a better approach. Find a task that you actually want to accomplish using a web interface and build it. I found that an AI can help outline your solution and help give answers to very specific questions. I found that sketches, like the ones I presented here, help me think through problems and get to solutions quickly. Every artist and creator has their own version of sketching. Developers should too. Thanks for watching.